So when I say liberation process or uh, discontinuation for mechanical ventilation, it is nothing but you know, being able to identify that time point where there is a good balance between the respiratory system workload or the demand on one side and the capacity, the ability to meet with the demand on the other side. right? And remember when I say respiratory system, that also includes, that is not just the lung, the parenchyma and the airway, it also includes the cardiovascular system, it includes the neuromuscular system, it includes the chest wall. The chest wall dynamics are so very important when it comes to the respiratory load. And the capacity on the other side is how well the parenchyma are able to withstand these things, Okay, how adequate the neuromuscular function is, how adequate the muscular function is. Right. So you need to identify the balance. I'll tell you how to go about it. So, uh, again, I told you I'm not going into papers. That is just to show you, you know, some of the large data sets, slightly older papers, which show you that more the number of days spent on a mechanical ventilator, lesser is going to be the survival. I'm not sure if it is directly the attributable, you know, mechanical ventilation, whether it is the attributable cause for death. But naturally, when you have somebody on a ventilator for longer, you tend to have the associated problems coming along with the ventilator. Okay, infectious complications, non-infectious complications, probably the need for long-term use of sedation. You know, so many factors, so many confounders also contribute to a reduced survival of these patients. Okay? So the earlier you get them off the ventilator, the better. Likewise, the probability of death also almost doubles when the period of mechanical ventilation crosses seven days. That is, more than a week of ventilation, the probability of death from any particular disease almost doubles. Therefore, your concept or your, uh, uh, your thinking of this weaning process, we call this as a fishbone algorithm, starts right there at the beginning. If you can look over there, I'm sorry, I cannot use pointers or cursors over there. So uh, you just see that at the start where you probably meet somebody with a respiratory failure, you need to intubate. The very next step is suspecting readiness to wean. Well, obviously, intubation and mechanical ventilation is not the only therapy that you would have done. So many pharmacological measures, antibiotics, probably nebulization, good suction clearance, many things also happen. So the moment you initiate this process of controlled mechanical ventilation, you also have to start having a plan for weaning this patient. You need to start suspecting each day from the second day onwards whether this patient is ready to come off the ventilator. Okay? That's what we call as suspecting readiness to wean. And how do you suspect? How do you go about? You look into certain variables. That's called the predictors or the weaning parameters, which you look into. Uh, you know, many of us over the years subconsciously start doing it. And then you execute certain tests. You do what is known as a spontaneous breathing trial. If the patient passes that, succeeds this on spontaneous breathing trial, you go ahead with extubation. If not, there is a different algorithm. So start thinking about weaning the moment you actually initiate somebody on a ventilation. Okay? You don't have to necessarily leave them on forever. And that's a simple classification of patients based on their ability to be weaned off. We call them simple, difficult, and prolonged. Simple, vast majority of our patients fit into the simple weaning category or the simple liberation category where even the first attempt at a spontaneous breathing trial, you suspect readiness, you execute, you look for the readiness criteria, you put them to spontaneous breathing trial, they pass, they get extubated. Okay? In these people, the morbidity, mortality, everything seems to be on the lower side. Whereas when you need up to three SBTs or up to a week on the mechanical ventilation, those patients you would call them as difficult to wean or the difficult weaning uh, strata. These have a peculiar set of reasons why they fail and you need to have an algorithm to approach that. And people who need longer than seven days of mechanical ventilation or people who need more than three SBTs classify under the prolonged mechanical, I'm sorry, prolonged weaning category. Many of our COVID patients often fit into the prolonged category, difficult to prolong category for certain reasons. Right? And accordingly, based on whether it is a simple or a difficult or a prolonged weaning, obviously the mortality, 
in the incidence of extubation failure, the, uh, the necessity for reintubation, all of those are significantly higher for patients on prolonged weaning category compared to the simple ones. Now, so you have initiated somebody on ventilation for acute respiratory failure. Let's leave alone the low GCS and post-operative causes. Let's stick to acute respiratory failure as the indication for intubation. From the next day onwards, of course, see, again, we need to be a little, uh, we need to have some, uh, what to say, common sense over there. If uh, we are going to be doing an ARDS ventilation, somebody on prone ventilation, somebody who's on a neuromuscular infusion, neuromuscular block in infusion, we're not going to be doing these things on day one, day two, obviously. Okay. So when I said start thinking about this as early as possible, it doesn't mean you will subject somebody who is prone to any of these investigations. right? So the moment you tide over the initial crisis, you look at certain of these basic parameters, basically the respiratory workload that I told you. So uh, starting off with the respiratory system, PF ratios, you know, a PAO2 comfortably above 60, FAO2 below the non-toxic, level less than 60% of 0.6, a convenient PEEP less than 8 centimeters water, a reasonable PCO2. You don't need to have a normal value for everybody, especially when you're ventilating somebody with COPD or somebody who is known to have a chronic respiratory acidosis, never try to bring the PCO2 down to normal. What is normal for us is not normal for that patient. And adequate inspiratory effort as assessed by the trigger setting that is required for the patient. Uh, I'm sure this was addressed during the basics of mechanical ventilation session. So if it is somebody who's not able to trigger the ventilator at say two liters per second, okay, of a flow trigger, then that's bad. Uh, somebody who's needing really low or a very, very high sensitivity for trigger setting, that is again, not a person who's going to do too very well. Next, similarly, cardiovascular things. Obviously the patient should not be having any acute uh, cardiovascular catastrophe like an acute coronary event you should have a reasonably comfortable heart rate anything less than 120 would be fine of course there it says 140 and the problem is the greater your heart rate you know the cardiac filling time decreases and uh, that pushes the heart into something like a non-systolic or the so-called diastolic failure you can have increased pulmonary hydrostatic pressures with possible extravascular lung water which can again worsen the lung compliance, gas exchange, all of those things. Okay? So you need to have comfortable uh, heart rates, a comfortable perfusion pressure. Okay? Obviously, the blood pressure, the map should be very convenient. You don't want to have too much of an afterload for the heart at the same time because getting somebody off the ventilator is a significant stress to the patient's heart, especially if it is already a failing heart. This process is a very, very big challenge for the person's cardiovascular system. So you need to have optimal afterload, you need to have optimal contractility, you need to have optimized the preload adequately. All of these things should have happened side by side. Mental status, obviously, you're not going to be extubating somebody who is still in profound coma. So you need to have a reasonable GCS, preferably something above 13, or if you're having somebody on the tube, obviously, above a 90 or a 10P seems to be good enough okay, because you want that person to be able to take care of his airway the moment you extubate and various other uh, factors like obviously you don't want to have somebody who is very very febrile where the metabolic demands could be high obviously fever is not an absolute contraindication okay, I'm just telling you to run all these things as suspecting readiness criteria okay if somebody is having fever it is not a contraindication to weaning process just keep that in mind. Likewise, uh, absence of significant dyselectrolytemias, a hypo-hyperkalemia, which could come in the way of either cardiovascular performance or neuromuscular performance, muscle performance. You don't want to challenge the respiratory capacity further. Okay? There could be variable muscle weakness happening because of electrolyte disturbances. A lower hemoglobin. Again, for all practical purposes in the ICU, a target of 7, 7.5 of hemoglobin is reasonably okay, excepting for situations like somebody who is having an acute coronary event or somebody, uh, you know, who is elderly, somebody who is actively exsanguinating. But otherwise, 7.5 is a reasonably good target unless there is some other condition where you are facing a supply demand mismatch, then you need to consider optimizing the hemoglobin before possible weaning and extubation various other subjective criteria based on the disease process itself you know you like i started off with common sense okay? 
So you need to obviously know that the disease process also is beginning to improve, right? And these are the tests. Once you feel somebody is reasonably fitting into most of these criteria, the cardiovascular system, the respiratory system, all of these seem to be reasonably okay. Then you look into these so-called predictor tests. Okay, nothing but again the same variables, heart rate, blood pressure, respiratory rate, minute volume, maximal inspiratory pressure as a measure of the respiratory system capacity. Okay, so uh, I'm not going to be reading through these values. You need to be having near physiological values for most of these. When I say meaning predictor tests, none of these have been shown to be like, you know, uh, superior to the other. We don't know how exactly all of these should preferably be within the physiologic or the acceptable ranges. Okay, if one of them is a little deviant here or there, it doesn't really matter. Try to identify if it is a correctable factor. If you are able to come down on any one of these which are abnormal, do that. But it doesn't mean that one of them is haywire you cannot wean the patient. No, you need to have most of these in a reasonably good range. That's all. Okay, And there are no, uh, you know, uh, specific scores or validated tools using these uh, weaning predictor tests that you can use at the bedside to say that, uh, okay, yes, a score of more than five or a score of more than seven, definitely the patient is going to make it through the weaning process and the extubation. No, there's no such thing. All of these, you would like to just run them in mind. I just want to dwell a little upon those last two things. One is the, you know, the maximal inspiratory pressure, I told you, is a measure of the respiratory system capacity. Basically, what we are supposed to do is make the patient suck, take a deep inspiratory uh, effort across a closed airway. Okay, obviously, we cannot be doing this in our patients who already have uh, altered lung physiology, altered lung dynamics. So. For all practical purposes in the ICU, this test cannot be done, but where it is possible, let's say if it's a post-operative patient who is otherwise reasonably okay, that's the kind of value you need to have at least. The patient should be able to generate a negative inspiratory force of at least minus 30 centimeters water. Okay, uh, So anything lesser than that means to say that the respiratory capacity is low. Okay. And the other thing is what is known as a rapid shallow breathing index, which many of the respirators, the ventilators themselves display on the right hand corner or wherever, you know, nothing but respiratory rate by tidal volume values less than uh, when you have somebody doing a rapid shallow breathing, you have values more than 105, 100 to 105. So it is preferable to have a value less than 105. Again, these are not like I told you earlier, not clear cut. So it is possible that I have all the other values fitting well within criteria, but just that RSBI is a little, you know, uh, higher. It is not an absolute contraindication. You just keep that in mind. See if there is something that can be corrected to optimize that. If not, it is not wrong altogether to proceed with the process still. Okay. So again, uh, various trials have looked into each one of these so-called weaning predictors individually to study their positive predictive value, negative predictive value. None of those have shown any significant positive predictive value, but at least RSBI, forget the MIP again, I told you it's not going to be possible in most of our ICU setting. Uh, the RSBI has a very good uh, negative predictive value, meaning to say if you have a value more than 105, it is highly possible that the patient may perform badly in a weaning test or an extubation trial. Okay. Of course, using these parameters, we have various indices like, you know, there is a crop index, there is a integrated weaning index. I've not even put those up on the slides. I don't want you to be confused. None of those are validated tools. Okay. Just go by these heart rate, respiratory rate, SpO2, PF ratio, how much PP you are using, how much FiO2 you are using. And then RSBI is something that you can easily look into. So again, a couple of tests, just reassuring that uh, going by any one of these criteria really doesn't uh, save you from a weaning failure or an extubation failure. All of these you need to be used together, uh, uh, you know, as a bundle or as a package. So this study has shown that by using RSBI as a criteria to predict weaning success, it's only been demonstrated that in the patients, when you strictly went by RSBI criteria, they only spent one extra day longer on the mechanical ventilator. Otherwise, uh, you know, there was no difference between the patients who 
succeeded or failed the SPT. Okay. Likewise, other trials which have evaluated various other parameters that we have just spoken about, it is no different. Okay, whether you are talking about the success of SBT or whether you are talking about the success of an extubation, whether you use them or didn't use them, uh, it really didn't matter. Okay. Uh, if I have to confuse you a little more, those are the basic weaning parameters. Okay. Uh, just keep these things registered in your mind. You may want to go and look up, read up a little more if you are interested. If you don't want to, it's absolutely enough. There are certain things that we talk about heart rate variability as a measure of autonomic dysfunction. See, extubation or liberating somebody from a mechanical ventilation is also a big challenge to the autonomic system and the cardiovascular system. So we tend to see certain things that we quantify, the heart rate variability which we quantify. Okay, So these also can be used to predict success or failure of a SBT. Again, as a standalone tool, it is not useful. If it can be incorporated along with your other tools, probably yes. Diaphragmatic thickness function with increasing use of ultrasound in the ICU for various reasons. We also have started doing a lot of diaphragm ultrasound, the so-called diaphragm thickness fraction. And sometimes you also look for diaphragmatic excursion, DE, using ultrasound. You can assess the muscle function. Uh, there are many trials which have shown sort of a correlation between the existence of diaphragmatic weakness and poor performance when it comes to SBT or extubation. But again, it has not uh, been validated as a significant tool. Definitely, yes, as an add-on to your basic weaning parameters, it will be handy. You can see the area under curve that seems to be pretty significant, meaning to say that you know it is almost uh, a positive predictive tool. If there is weakness, your patient could have a weakness. Uh, and this is another thing that we've started looking into off late, the use of BNP as a measure of fluid overload state. So when you have fluid overload, there is going to be extravascular lung water, which is going to compromise respiratory dynamics, which is going to compromise on oxygenation indices. Okay, So BNP, if you believe is a tool of volume overload status, then a delta BNP at the start of therapy and with institution of therapy and serial values, a delta can also predict the possibility of uh, outcomes to weaning and outcomes to extubation. Again, let me repeat, these are not validated, but definitely in the setting of a difficult weaning or a prolonged weaning where you know that something is wrong, but you're not able to pinpoint all of these really come in handy at that time. Definitely not for simple weaning. Simple weaning finishes off with the basic weaning indices. As it gets a little more challenging, you include each one of them.